Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am Brad Wilson, Employee Benefits Consultant with Hub International. We work closely with the NSFM, uh, AMA, and municipalities regarding the benefit plan. And I know looking at the, the list of participants here uh, today, uh, familiar names uh, that I know we've had some interactions before, so welcome everyone. And today we have Colin Wicks from Desjardins with us to present an overview of the LTD Early Assistance Program. Hi, Colin. Hey, Brad, how you doing? Great. So Colin is the early assistance specialist. Uh, he grew up in the Halifax area and currently resides in Dartmouth. He has a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Science in Kinesiology. Colin joined Desjardins as a rehab specialist in 2021. He came to Desjardins with over seven years of experience as a kinesiologist and rehab consultant with another insurer. He brings a wealth of experience having worked with a number of employers and clinics throughout Nova Scotia, Atlanta, Canada, and Ontario. And Colin has been working with the NSFM plan for the past two years as the sole designated early assistance specialist. So without further ado, Colin, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brad, and, and thank you everybody for coming here today to uh, see our presentation on the NSFM Early Assistance Services and Best Practices. Quick thumbs up, Brad, if you can see my slideshow. Is it uh, viewable from your end? Okay, Looks great. Perfect. Awesome. So I guess we'll start with talking about why the Early Assistance Program came to be. And essentially, in, in, in short terms, it's to ensure that the individuals, when they're off work, and uh, receive the supports that are available for anybody, um, whether they're on long-term disability um, or uh, within the elimination period, um, where they quite often don't have short-term disability um, uh, during that period. So we developed the early assistance program to ensure that the individuals who are off receive the same support um, to help facilitate their recoveries and return to work to help ensure that they don't have a prolonged work absence and to help prevent uh, a transition to long-term disability at the end of that elimination period and if they do to help prevent uh, a prolonged work absence again and prolonged LTD claim. So we, we simplified the process for when to consider uh, the early assistance program to essentially as soon as an individual has been off work for 10 days. Um, so we ask that, that the form be submitted, which we'll review here in a moment. And we ask that the form be sent once they are completely off work um, for 10 business days and to be sent as well, even if they are receiving uh, W Workers' Compensation Board benefit, um, any other benefit, really, as long as the individual is off for any reasons besides a pre pre-planned vacation. Uh, we ask that the form be sent uh, in through Desjardins um, and the form itself, as you can see in the next slide here on the right, has also been kind of simplified a little bit over the past year as well. Um, we have created a new process for the certificate number, um, which is essentially the division number with their birth date. Um, and the form here, you can see I, I've circled at the top the from section um, to, to, to bring up a reminder that when the form is submitted, if you could include your contact information as well, um, thus allowing me to, to reach out to you after, um, after the form is received and after I've spoken with the individual to involve you in the process as I'll discuss here momentarily as well. We ask the form be com completed and submitted via, via our secure link, uh, which is here on the left. And it also can be found in my email signature as well. And we also ask that you inform the employee that an early assistance specialist from Desjardins will be contacting them as well uh, to ensure that our, our contact with them isn't entirely out of the blue. 
So once we receive the form, uh, I get assigned the uh, task to review the, the form and to contact the employee. Uh, I will use the number that you provide on the form. So we do ask that it is a number that you believe I would be able to get in contact with them directly with um, information like their work phone number or work email. Um, quite often, you know, is leaves me uh, unsuccessful getting a hold of them and can result in a delay in being able to initiate the process for early assistance. When I speak with the individual, I do an in-depth telephone interview, starting with the, the reasons why their, their work absence was precipitated, um, obviously their medical diagnosis and where they're at in the narrative of their medical treatment. I'll review their functional levels, things like their uh, ability to perform their activities of daily living um, and how it's been impacted by their condition. And I'll also review in depth uh, their current treatment as well as the, the treatment that has been discussed, recommended and available to them as well. And, and that provides, as I'll discuss momentarily, the, really the crux of our what we're looking at as well when it comes to how we can help facilitate the recovery by helping uh, support and fund both physical and psychotherapies and vocational therapies, whatever is needed. Uh, an important piece as well, obviously, is having the discussion surrounding their employment history, whether they've had previous workplace absences, um, what those absences were related to, if they've attempted return to work, how familiar they are with the return to work process, um, as well as any type of performance uh, issues, interpersonal issues, um, job satisfaction, uh, all different factors that can impact, uh, you know, the individual's uh, desire to, to want to pursue a return to the workplace potentially. So my role from there after performing the initial interview is to identify any opportunity to be able to help and facilitate the individual's recovery. Um, quite often that does come through the form of by funding physical and psychotherapies that are often more expensive than what the individual can afford through their regular extended health benefits plan. Um, so my role there is to really ensure that there are no barriers related to their access to therapy, um, especially if they're, you know, waiting for that through the public system as well. I can help ensure that they're able to access private uh, resources that uh, would be funded fully for them as well to expedite their recovery. Um, I would also work with them to help set healthy return to work expectations and to ensure that the returning to the workplace is a, is a part of their, their goal uh, at the end of the day. I would liaison with them, their treatment providers, as well as the employer yourselves to help ensure that they are, uh, you, everyone is updated and everybody is on the same page with regards to their recovery and their expected return and how that may be facilitated by the employee and the employer. And my, my role also uh, would also involve helping develop, implement, and support individualized return to work plans um, to help the individual get back to the workplace successfully. The employee's role, um, uh, we would expect that the individual would actively participate in their own recovery and follow through medical treatment as prescribed. Um, and we would also expect them to set progressive and realistic goals related to return to function and their return to the workplace. Um, it's always an important to ensure that that is part of their, their goal and that they're, they're working progressively towards that as well. The employer's role, we ask that you work with the early assistance specialist myself to help implement and support these return to work plans, um, which would often uh, uh, involve the potential accommodations for work duties and or hours. Um, we would ask that you help implement reorientation, retraining, and to help monitor the return to work uh, plan as the individual returns. Um, I will say as well, you know, in a vast majority of our situations, um, employees and employers work uh, themselves um, and kind of work to develop the return to work plan. And it's, it's not a mandatory service that you 
uh, access my support. Um, sometimes in more straightforward situations, again, the employer and employee would feel comfortable about returning and occasionally people just return full time. Um, but there are situations where there is more complexity. Um, there are more need for accommodations. Um, there is certain psychosocial um, nuances as well that can, you know, be uh, be accommodated and can be helped mitigated by the involvement of the early assistance specialist and my support. Return to work meeting is also a big part of this um, and it would precipitate a, a return to work plan by getting all parties together, myself, the employer, the employee, to review the return to work plan that's been approved by the employer to help set clear expectations surrounding that plan, um, what the milestones are, what tasks would be assigned, what retraining, what accommodations, and also to help engage uh, and set to help the employee come to ease with the return to work process at times and helping them clarify any questions and concerns concerns they may have uh, about returning. So this can be a very helpful resource as well, if you would uh, like to arrange one of these with me as well. So there are circumstances when early assistance wouldn't be appropriate. Um, I, I've been working with the group now for two years, so I've been able to, to see a different circumstances of when um, we wouldn't be able to necessarily assist in with our early assistance program. Um, it's important to note that our program does not replace the individual's primary medical care. Um, so therefore, you know, in situations where there's more common complex medical diagnosis. I think the classic example may be cancer. Um, there's little opportunity that I would have in the acute stages of their treatment and recovery until they've reached that medical stability. So medical stability is a, a big component that I am looking for to ensure that their primary care is helping resolve um, so that I can help fill in any blanks when it comes to establishing different therapies. Um, in the past couple of years, quite often, you know, the most commonly used have been physiotherapy, occupational therapy, kinesiology, um, often in combination in a work hardening setting, uh, as well as psychotherapy, whether that be cognitive behavioral therapy um, and different trauma therapies like cognitive processing, um, ART, accelerated resolution. I'd say those are most commonly used, um, but there's not always the opportunity to do that if the individual is still acutely um, disabled. So uh, when it comes to, it's a good opportunity to bring up the fact that when and I, I, um, I would need to speak directly with the individual in order to do a, an initial interview um, from a medical confidentiality standpoint, um, I, the individual would need to be at a, a position stability to be able to converse with me and have that conversation. Um, I wouldn't be able to, due to confidentiality reasons, perform it through a family member. Um, therefore, you, you know, if an individual is acutely hospitalized, whether that's due to, you know, a varying conditions, um, then therefore I wouldn't be able to have much opportunity to assist and I would need to wait uh, until the individual is at a state to be able to communicate with me directly um, to be able to have that. Another circumstance we come across occasionally as well where we're not able to assist is when the form arrives late. Um, we, we do ask that it be sent to, as soon as it can be after those 10 days to be able to help us um, in, initiate the process as soon as possible. Um, but if the form is sent with delay and the the elimination period has expired and the and the individual would be in a long-term disability period, then again, that wouldn't be a situation where we would be able to assist with the early assistance uh, services. Some other circumstances we've come across, however, where a rare have been non-contact. Um, so we, we do have a policy to attempt contacting three times. I will leave messages and, and attempt to contact them, but there will there has been circumstances where they have not gotten back to me. I will make the employer aware in such circumstances, but uh, it's also helpful again to ensure that they are aware that I will be reaching out to them uh, to make that contact as well. And 
there's also been uh, again rare circumstances of individuals being non-compliant where they will simply say no i don't want your support i don't want your services um, again however rare I, I do follow up with the employer to make you guys aware of the situation and try to, to work uh, productively together to, to move forward um, in circumstances where we don't have an opportunity to assist or we have been assisting, but we're nearing the end of the elimination period, I, I will reach out to you uh, four to six weeks prior to inform you of whether or not a long-term disability application is imminent and to send in the employer form um, for that application. So when it comes to submitting a long-term disability claim, uh, three forms are required an employee form and an attending physician statement that the employee submits and an employer form, which the employer submits, I would send you an email um, with the, basically, again, the, the, the fact that an LT claim is upcoming. And I would send you the form as well to be submitted again through the uh, secure link that's on uh, the page here as well. Um, from there, the claim will be transferred to the long-term disability case manager, whomever that would be. Currently, it's Vanessa Andrew, and she would reach out uh, once the elimination period has expired um, to have a conversation with yourselves as well as the employee, um, and we'll review the claim from there to determine whether or not long-term disability is approved. That is the end of my current uh, presentation myself, and I, I would love to answer any questions that you guys may have. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, just we'll take a minute here. Anyone on the line have any questions for Colin? about discuss today or about um, any past experience they've had with the early assistance program. Has anybody on the line engaged with it before? I think I recognize some names there on the line for sure. You know, some groups obviously we use the, the program a, a little bit more just based on size and amount of employees. Um, and then there's some kind of smaller groups as well. Um, so I guess, that, again, if you guys do have any questions about the early assistance program itself, um, you can always feel free to reach out to me and I can help you with that if you need the form. Um, and I've also met on occasion with particular groups one-on-one -on -one to have a similar chat, and to have a discussion about the program. It, it's similar to what we've done today. I have a question. Um, what about people that are off on WCB, like if they're injured at work? Is Do, do you kind of um, cooperate with that program or are they completely separate? It's a great, it's a great, great question. And it, it actually came up recently. And, and what happens in Workers' Compensation Board is they provide a lot of the same support that, that I would essentially. And in those circumstances, I, I may not be funding a, a therapy. They may already have Workers' Compensation Board involved. But what can happen and, and what we've seen is um, individuals could have secondary conditions. Um, workers' Compensation Board, let's say, could be covering someone for a sprained hand. Um, and once that hand heals, they close their claim. The individual could come back in that time and could have developed a secondary condition related to their heart, which prevents them from returning. So Workers' Compensation Board would say, okay, we're not covering you. And then the individual, you know, would require the long-term disability support. So so in those circumstances, we, we just said really simply, once the individuals off for 10 days, send the form in and try to send it as soon after those 10 days are up as possible so that I can reach out, can get an idea of what's going on, can ensure that their expectations are set and can help get the long-term disability process and application moving as well if it doesn't look like they're going to be moved, getting back in the, in, in that before that elimination period expires. So we send the form in, even if they go on WCB immediately yep. in 10 days. Okay, good. Yep. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Gina. It's a good point as well. And in, in some conversations that we've had with municipalities as well, we found there can be other similar situations um, 
where the early assistance program is not income based. So it is not an income payment like the LTD plan itself. When somebody reaches LTD and they're approved, they begin to receive their income payment. The early assistance program is not related to the income payment. So even as in your example, if it's WCB or we've heard from other municipalities, sometimes a member may be off and being paid with sick time or some type of salary continuance um, plan, that's OK. So if the member is receiving income elsewhere, it doesn't matter. And the early assistance program should still be engaged in that way because it can offer support. Uh, to help the member return, even if they're still getting income. So regardless of, of what, where the member is being paid, still after the 10 day absence, submit that form to the early assistance program to see if there's support that can be provided. That's a great point, Brad, because we have heard that on occasion that people, there's some confusion, and I think it came from our name initially, back when it used to be referred to as um, early AEI, um, early intervention, and we've really clarified that to early assistance um, to ensure that, that that isn't the confusion and that we aren't an income replacement. So no matter what, ensure that that form is sent just after 10 days. Again, like I said, unless they are on vacation for an extended period of time and you know they're returning um, for any other reasons to submit that form at day 11. And I think I see Michelle, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you, Brad. Um, Colin, what, what, is your, what is your phone number? Yep, so my phone number is one eight seven seven. Nine zero six five 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 one, and my extension is five five nine eight six three one. Okay, thank you. And, and that's a great intro again, kind of for another one of the big points, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is when you submit that form, um, if you could ensure that you include your contact information in that from section, whether it's your email, your phone number. Um, I, I do have some contact for some of you, but every now and then I receive a form where I'm unable to figure out who and how, how I would contact them back. So that if you can please remember that, that would be great as well. Great. And one question in the chat here, Colin. So what happens if an employee is off for 10 days, then comes back to work for a few weeks and then is off again? How long after they return to work do you continue to follow along with their progress? Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, I try to stay um, in touch until they return to work full time, unless there is some ongoing accommodation or concern. Um, but once they do return to work full time, um, that would restart kind of the elimination period after they would go off to work, go off work again, full time again. So unfortunately, it would put us in a process where again, if they were to go back full time, then they were to go off again. We would ask that once they're off completely, um, off work completely, not even working part time, once they're off work completely, uh, to send that form after 10 days. Okay. Oh, I see one more coming, perhaps. No, Brad, chat. it was just just me. I was going to jump in on that piece of it. Um, I think if Colm's working with that individual historically in that first absence, returned him to work for her, and the individual went right back off again, let's say a month later, there is an opportunity to, to connect with Colm. And I don't, I, I want to, my I'd love to capitalize on this program, you know, and I don't want it to be very rigid. So there is some flexibility that if we've been involved with that individual, they come back, their working column gets hit, they come off and there's concern um, 
to reach out to Colin um, to determine if we should be initiating our intervention earlier. It's an exception to the rule, um, but I think um, things get lost in the process and we forget things. So when you start to identify those kind of red flags, I think it's an opportunity to to reach out for sure. I think Ian was asking there, uh, the clarifying the elimination period. So that is the period in days from the last day worked from their date of disability until their first day of long-term disability coverage coming into effect. Uh, the day they get paid for the first time is my understanding. Oh, it's for LTD, not for early assistance. Correct. Yeah, for for LTD, the elimination period. Correct. Yeah. So that is the the day. Usually, for most groups with you, it's 119 days. It's usually around four months. Um, sometimes there's a few groups that could have six months or up to a year, um, but usually it's four months, and that's why it's important on that form to make sure you include the last day worked, um, so that I can look at and as well as the division and class numbers. So I look at the contract. I find out what the elimination period is. I calculate that based on the last day worked and I get an understanding of when their first day of effective long-term disability payments would be if their claim is approved. So that's a big date because we want to ensure that all the paperwork and all those three forms especially are submitted by that date to ensure that there's no delay in the long-term disability claim being approved or not or reviewed. It's yes. in days, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's in days. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so typically, Ian, it's about typically it's about four months uh, of time for for uh, for most, if not all, municipalities. Um, and, and at that point, as, as uh, Colin suggested, the the claim just transitions to LTD. But typically, there's more uh, detailed medical and information that gets provided to assess the LTD claim. So that's why the the recommended time frame is is longer out in front, so that the member has time to get what they need from their physician, and the LTD um, claim can be assessed by the time the member's income is due to start. And many of the same supports that Colin would be able to provide, uh, you know, during that that um, short term period, let's call it, if you will. So during that assistance period, if the member does transition to LTD uh, beyond that four month period, many of the same supports are available through the LTD um, plan itself. So that would be determined by the LTD case manager when they assess the claim. If there are physical or mental supports that that are um, needed to help the member uh, return to work, then they they would be coordinated and provided um, through the LTD plan itself. And, and, and that gets back to kind of the original point as well, Brad, is that when, when somebody has a disability claim, whether that's short-term disability, long-term disability, they have the opportunity within our organization to get rehabilitative support. And that's where myself and Krista come from. We're a, a specialized department that is there to help. Uh, provide support to disability case management to ensure that individuals who are off get the most robust funded therapy they can, as well as return to work supports and what we've mentioned before. And in this group, when there's no income replacement short term disability claim, we wanted to ensure that just because they weren't receiving the income replacement, that they weren't missing out on getting the rehabilitative support that people would get if they did have a disability claim. So that's really the purpose of the program, right, is to ensure that everybody, no matter what, as soon as they're off work, have the opportunity to be assessed to get that support implemented and funded, no matter who they are or whatever is kind of going on. So that that is the, the role in a nutshell and the purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, great point. I think a segue there as well is that um, to engage with the early assistance um, program and and any any support that is provided and comes with it, there's no cost to the municipality, no direct cost, and there's no cost to the member 
um, for any of the services and support that they receive as well. So it, it's all part of your LTD plan and the LTD uh, rate that you pay um, as a municipality. And, and you know, there's there's your handful of people that will return to work, they'll go off work, they'll have their per medical procedure, they'll have their couple few weeks of recovery and they return to work full time. Um, but the people that we really, you know, and I have a few examples to draw on now, the people you're really looking to help are those complex cases, you know, your complex mental health, where there's a trauma diagnosis, um, individuals who have been assessed by uh, maybe a, a psychiatrist, but, don't have access readily to dynamic psychotherapy models or don't have the funds to be able to uh, afford something like that. So, you know, those have been the really rewarding cases of being able to ensure you are able to fund and, and to avoid delay in people getting those programs and, and then seeing the reward as well after having them engaged in, you know, two, three, four weeks, seeing them making those improvements and then helping them reach the finish line by working with them to, to get back to the workplace, but also to have the pillars in place as well to ensure that they sustain their return. So I, I guess I, I, I always hope that, you know, to your example there earlier there, Gina, that hopefully people, you know, don't come back out or afterwards. Um, but I will have, as Krista mentioned, the rapport with them and hopefully we'll have a foundation of having work with them that if those circumstances do come up, obviously, please do reach out to me and I will be able to help consult and support as needed as well. Okay, Ian, in terms of income continuance, if there's no short term disability, the staff member would use sick time, vacation time, and EI to get them to 119 days, but could use your program in any event. Yeah, correct. Yes. So the, the early assistance program is not in any way related to how or where they're receiving any income from. And it's mixed bag when I speak with people. Sometimes they're on workers' compensation board. They've got near full compensation. Sometimes they have nothing. You know, sometimes people have a lot of sick time, a bank that they would use. Um, but that's often one of the first questions I get and could be a really helpful part of when you first inform them of the program um, that we aren't an income replacement. and But we are here to help support and to help ensure that they're getting um, you know, funding for therapy and rehabilitative services um, to help expedite their recovery. Michelle has her, her hand up there. Sorry, yes, we're moving to a new building here. We're having some technical issues, so I might have froze <laughs> there. Um, so when when the person is over age 65, they no longer can be contribute to the, the Desjardins plan. So for those people, then obviously, if they're not contributing to it, then then this this process here is not gone through with that employee. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yes. This, uh, the, L this the LTD, Sorry. the LTD benefit ends at sixty-five. Correct. So the early, right. the early assistance is tied to that. So you are correct. Okay. So there's so if if there was such a case, then then um you know there is no ten day form that I send given that age age um restriction put on there, right? Is that right? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Like we're maybe getting okay. to the to the end of questions here, Brad. I, I, I don't see they're... anything else in the <laughs> chat or any other hands. So um, I think perhaps we'll wrap up for today. And um, certainly if if things come to mind, you know, after you you have time to sit down and kind of reflect on uh, on the conversation today a bit, then um, you can certainly reach out to uh, to Colin and uh, and he'll be he'll be sure to. Uh, answer your inquiries and uh, and go from there. And at any time, I think of, as we've always said in the past, um, you know, as a plan administrator, 
or uh, as part of the leadership at the uh, at the municipality, you know, there's there's many different contacts. And if there comes a point in time where you're not sure to turn, you can reach out to us at Hub, of course, and we can point you in the right right direction. And uh, on uh, on any early assistance uh, pieces, that'll be us pointing you toward Colin. Yeah, and I'm just throwing my email there and my phone number into the group chat here. So if you guys want to write that down or refer to it in here in the future, I, I will be available if any questions pop into your head down the road. And I am always uh, look forward to the opportunity to meet you guys one on one if you ever do need to reach out. Excellent. Well, thanks so much uh, for joining again, everyone today, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming.